This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. They are a sleeping giant, a potentially potent force in New York City and national politics. They are the second largest racial ethnic group in the city and the nation, and their numbers are growing. They have had a profound effect on New York City culture, commerce, and, importantly, cuisine. They are the future of New York City and America. They are New York City Latinos, or Hispanics if you prefer. Here to discuss Latinos in New York, past, present, and future, are Angelo Falcone and Gabrielle Haslip Vieira. Angelo was founder and president of the National Institute for Latino Policy, and for more than 30 years he has been advocating to improve Hispanics' political clout. He is chair of the U.S. Census Advisory Committee on Hispanic Populations. He's the author and editor of four books and written scores of chapters, reports, papers, newspaper columns, and is a frequent media commentator on things Latino. Gabrielle Haslip Vieira is professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at City College at CUNY, another CUNY guy, and past director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. He is a specialist in the evolution of Latino communities in New York City, and he has authored and edited a number of books and articles. In 1995, he edited with Professor Sherry Baver of City College a groundbreaking book, Latinos in New York, Communities in Transition. He, Professor Baver, and Angelo are co-editing a second edition, which looks at Latino New York 15 years later. Welcome, Gabrielle. Welcome back, Angelo. Okay, this book was a groundbreaking book. Twelve essays, first book-length analysis of the past and, and present condition of Latinos. Why, in the subsequent 15 years, there ain't much? Why? Well, uh, that's not really clear. Um, uh, one of the problems that we have uh, in the New York area with regard to research in this area is that um, uh, we don't really have um, a sufficient number of specialists who actually focus on the Latino communities mm -hmm. in New York. They might look at Latinos nationwide or in other parts of the uh, in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have some. Uh, uh, a, a specialists in Latino studies or Puerto Rican studies who are doing work in other areas that have been neglected, like mm -hmm. uh, the uh, communities in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, communities in Boston, uh, communities in Chicago, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Let's focus then on what you wrote in 1995. What was the status of these communities in transition and what's changed? And in a sense, let me follow up with a couple of questions. You know, why a second edition? Why now? And why Falcone? But let's talk about the 1995 study. Yeah. Um, we thought of it as a pioneering work uh, because we were at, at CUNY. We were teaching courses on um, Latinos in, in the United States. And uh, one of the problems was that most of the material uh, focused on uh, Mexican, Mexican-American communities mm -hmm. in, the, in the Southwest and in Texas. And um, there were these studies that uh, were available for students on the Cuban communities in Florida. And there were, uh, you know, some of the studies that have been done on Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Ricans in New York City. But um, by the time we put that book out in 1995, uh, it was clear that, you know, Puerto Ricans were not the only uh, important uh, Latino subgroup in the city, that there were these other groups that were becoming uh, important in terms of the uh, demographics and impact on society and the, eco and the economy. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, nothing had really been done systematically on these other, on these other groups. Right. So that was one of the main reasons that motivated us to... Uh, to Why a second edition? 
Well, because of the major changes that have taken place uh, since 1995. Um, the Puerto Rican community has declined in terms of numbers relative to the other Latino subgroups. And absolutely, since, uh, haven't they declined absolutely in numbers as Puerto Ricans move out of the city? Yes. Uh, however, it's still the second most important uh, in terms of the numbers. Right, uh, group behind the, Dominicans. Um, well, no, that's, no? Not, that's not absolutely oh, clear. Oh, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's a, Correct me that's when a, I'm wrong. That's a media perception, but uh, I think in the next five to ten years, the Dominicans will probably be a larger right. group. But one of the things that's interesting about the scholarship that you mentioned is that, you know, in the heyday of the Puerto Rican community, in terms of uh, social science research, in the 60s and the 70s, Ooh. when we were the poster boys of... Uh, culture of poverty. Culture of poverty. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. You know, this persistent poverty stuff, you know, all, all of this stuff. There was a lot, of, a lot of things written, but as the community declined in terms of uh, size and as you had these new populations in, I think a lot of social scientists in the city didn't know what to do with these new populations. Right. Uh, and there were a lot of... Uh, I remember spending a lot of time in my organization uh, during that transition, trying to get a lot of uh, professors at CUNY, white professors who look at issues of migration and sure. social, to, to pay more attention to Latinos. And uh, a lot of them just didn't know what to do. But eventually, I think you have, you have this tremendous industry of immigration research that has just blossomed. And I think uh, the idea is uh, here in New York, I don't think we, we actually quite caught up uh, in a, any serious way. Oh, I, I mean, just reviewing the literature in anticipation of our discussions, both the earlier discussion with you and, and that this discussion, it doesn't exist. It's not there. There's this huge dearth yep. of material on the topics that you addressed in the mm -hmm. book. Why Falcone? I mean, you, you <laughs> needed a third person and you needed Angelo? <laughs> Well, some of us have some personal issues that we're dealing with, and some of us are busy doing other things. I'm working on another project, and... Um, so, um, what about you know, his time, intellectual time, contributions? No. Oh, I think that, that he's absolutely super, especially with regard to the politics. I mean, he knows uh, New York City uh, and the Latino communities in New York City. I would say at this point, um, he knows he knows those communities better than any of us. I Some would of us say have that gotten, you are the foremost expert on Latino politics in New York by far. Yeah. I would agree. With I don't. You. I don't want to compliment. Let's let's get off that. Who <laughs> yeah, cares yeah. about that? We don't care. <laughs> actually, actually, you stole my line. I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, but you're too self-effacing. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, okay, let's let's go back to this book. Yes. You divide the book basically into four eras, and that last era essentially was, as I recall, 1945 to about 1990. Yes. Why don't you just briefly lay out those eras and then talk about you know. What's happened since then, which I'm sure is the, the, to the topic right. of the first chapter in the new book. Right. Um, in, the, um, in the 1995 edition, uh, uh, my own chapter began at the beginning of the um, 19th century, mm -hmm. 1810. Uh, the chronology is now going to be pushed back to the New Amsterdam Dutch period. Oh, so questions. you're going even ba back, not only That's forward. Right. Interesting. We're going back. New scholarship. Yeah, there's been some new scholarship. Mike Wallace has been very important. Oh, uh, I know. That's to that. brilliant stuff. Uh, the book that uh, he put out, uh, I can't remember. Gotham? Uh, the, uh, no, not Gotham. The one that... Oh, yeah. uh, um, who was the, uh, New York? The, uh, yeah, Nueva York. Oh, right. Based That's on, exactly based right. Based on the exhibit. That and Nueva had. York, by the way, for those those viewers who are interested, you can find it on the CUNY website. So you can go there. It's yeah. it's it, it's a wonderful. It's it's visual. It's great. Yeah. It's great exactly. stuff. And he does uh, uh, really important yeoman service in in articulating um, uh, the. Um, uh, or, or providing evidence and, and, and a narrative for the uh, uh, groups that, that could be identified hmm. as Latinos from the Dutch period up until, um, well, up until the cutoff date for that uh, book, which is 1945. Okay. He doesn't deal with the contemporary period. Okay. Uh, we've had that discussion. I've been trying to encourage him. To uh, and he's the uh, guy to do it. Uh, yes, exactly. Maybe we can uh, we can strong arm him. So he's we had uh, yeah we had these lengthy discussions with Juan, uh, he and yours truly and Juan Flores. We had these discussions with Mike Wallace about the exhibit and the uh, publication, uh, encouraging um, encouraging him to um, include the period from 1945 to the present because of its 
importance, especially in terms of the numbers. Sure. Oh, absolutely. The, the communities are, are, are still small. Uh, if you're dealing with the 19th century, it's, it's not clear that people that we would define as Latinos um, actually defined as such because uh, they're mostly from the uh, Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, overwhelmingly from the Caribbean, right. from Cuba and Puerto Rico, uh, to a much lesser degree from the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to remember that Cubans and Puerto Ricans were still part of the Spanish Empire. Sure. So there's this issue of um, uh, uh, whether they identified themselves or, or um, um, uh, identified themselves as Spanish subjects or as uh, primarily members of the local merchant classes in Puerto Rico and Cuba and, and had that kind of lo more localized identity. Socioeconomic and professional status of generally of these folks? Uh, for the most part, um, they were in um, economics and trade, commerce between uh, both of those islands, Cuba and Puerto Rico and New York. Uh, Mike Wallace uh, elaborates on that uh, to a considerable degree in his book, mm -hmm. uh, comes up with information that we were not uh, familiar with. And we're talking about the period from roughly 1800 up until um, up until the time that, uh, uh, up until the time of the Spanish-American War. Okay, so 1898, 1900. Exactly. So from 1900 to what, 1945? Yeah. What? Well, um, with the, um, with the uh, takeover of Puerto Rico uh, by the United States, you begin to get an increase in the number of Puerto Ricans coming to New York City relative to the other groups, South Americans, uh, even, uh, Mexicans actually pop up in the, uh, in, the, in the census enumerations and in other records, but it's a very small mm -hmm. group, very specialized group. Uh, whereas at the end of the 19th century, um, okay, it was mostly uh, a Spanish-Caribbean um, uh, group that was coming to New Hence York. Hence the term Hispanic, Hispaniola being. Yeah, right, um, primarily, um, Cuban and uh, Puerto Rican, but also Spaniards, okay? So it was sort of like a Can mix. I just ask a quick question? Sure. Why are Spaniards considered Hispanics or Latinos? I mean, why? Well, it, it's... Uh, That's a controversial the census, issue. The census would, Bureau... It's crazy. Census Bureau uses language uh, to define... For example, Brazilians by the Census Bureau are not considered um, Hispanics. Right, because they speak Portuguese. Portuguese, right. Okay, I, I, I just had to throw that out. And the so whole issue of the Spaniards is very controversial in the discussions that we have in the Latino community, whether to include them or not, because you know, obviously they're Europeans. Yeah. They're not from Latin America, yeah. they're not from the Caribbean, yeah. right? So I ask my students every semester, well, what do you feel about this? I mean, should we include the Spaniards under the rubric of Latino? And do they want to be included? And do and they the want to be included? No, they don't. Well, um, Go ahead. increasingly, I'm sorry. increasingly, uh, they're accepting uh, the label Hispanic or Latino. Probably but means means something to it them. It means something to them, exactly. Uh, economically and, and socially mm -hmm. and culturally. Sure. As in uh, and, and, Enrique Iglesias. Yeah, and the Spanish government <laughs> has been very active in terms yes. of, of promoting that relationship. Oh, interesting. Very yes. interesting. So we, we, we go from 1945 to 1990. What happens? Well, uh, before we go... No, go that, ahead. I'm okay. sorry. I'm jumping before ahead. Before we go to that, um, what had been a, 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 a relatively uh, mixed in terms of um, national, regional, or geographic background mm -hmm. in terms of the Latino communities in New York. You had Puerto Ricans, you had Spaniards, if we, you know, if we sure. include Spaniards. Sure. Uh, you had Cubans, you had some Dominicans, you, you even had some South Americans and some Central Americans. Mm -hmm. Numbers were quite small. Um, but during the course of the period from 1900 to 1945, the Puerto Rican component of, of, of the population increases dramatically mm -hmm. relative to the other groups. So that by 1945, before you get wow. the massive migration that takes place in the post-war post sure. period, uh, the Puerto Rican community was already dominant in terms of the numbers and the politics and, and the economics of, um, of the Latino communities in New York. Okay. So we come up to 1990, which is essentially right. when this, this, this chapter ends. But in some ways, 1990 is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a turning point. I mean, you've got, in the 22 years since then, you've got unprecedented 
Latino immigration numbers and an incredible diversity of sources, countries of origin, and all that stuff. Talk about what's happened from 1992, literally today. Okay, um, not sure you have the chronology correct. Okay, but, um, you can correct me. Um, I'm often a, a major change that begins to take place is uh, circa 1960. Okay? Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, because you have the, uh, the revolution in Cuba. Right. You have uh, the uh, beginnings of the Fidel Castro government. Now, mm. most of the Cubans who leave after the, after the Castro takeover wind up in Florida. Right. But a considerable number come okay. to Thank you. New York. Okay. Um, eventually, in the New York area, they uh, tend to be concentrated in, in New Jersey. Okay, but in which has got a substantial the, in, Cuban in the early, population. In the early fifties, okay. there was a substantial um, Cuban presence in Washington Heights, for example, mm. mm -hmm. in Astoria. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, those were the two major areas. Uh, now, you know, since then, the Cubans have um, uh, moved up and out. Exactly. Now, the other thing that begins to take place after 1960 is the overthrow of the Trujillo dictatorship in the Dominican Republic. Right. right. Um, prior to that, uh, Trujillo and the uh, regime in the Dominican Republic made it very difficult for um, Dominicans to leave, to emigrate from the country. Um, he wanted the Dominicans... Uh, in the country so that he could control them. You know, he was involved in this economic uh, uh, development, industrialization, et cetera, et cetera. And why lose your best people? Exactly. So he was involved in, uh, you know, edu uh, educating uh, Dominicans, uh, urbanizing them, and that sort of thing. Now, he's assassinated in 1961. Mm -hmm. And so after that, what you have is uh, political, um, let's call it political chaos, mm -hmm. um, uh, the number of Dominicans coming to New York or emigrating from the Dominican Republic begins to increase. Uh, and that increase uh, in Dominican emigration um, really begins to take off after the 1965 Civil War. Right, and also the, the, the 1965 changes in the immigration law exactly. must have had profound consequences exactly. in terms of Latino slash Hispanic immigration exactly. into the U.S. Exactly. Now, uh, so, um, and ever since then, uh, we've had these waves of... Uh, of uh, Dominicans coming to New York City or to other parts well, of the country. And what's interesting is the, the role of the fiscal crisis as well in the early 70s, so. 73, uh, which I think began a process of really uh, pushing Puerto Ricans out. Yes. And you have Dominicans kind of in many ways replacing them. In Where the are the Puerto country. Ricans going? Well, go Oh, on. we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Quit interrupting. <laughs> no, no, you can continue. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, Angelo, I think, is, is uh, perfectly right in saying that. Uh, the Dominicans that were coming in uh, into the city, uh, especially after the 1965 Civil War, uh, this was cheaper labor, uh, labor that could be exploited, um, uh, a lot of uh, undocumented uh, people. Yeah. Uh, Puerto Rican uh, workers, uh, you know, uh, their citizens, they knew their rights and, uh, uh, you know, expected benefits and that sort of thing. And so uh, the enterprises mm -hmm. in the city that were inclined to hire Puerto Ricans in the previous years or decades decided, oh, you know, these Dominicans are cheaper. Hmm. And uh, uh, let's replace the Puerto Ricans with the Dominicans. So there's both a push and a pull for yes. Dominicans coming in. As, 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 and most, most places, even Puerto Rico, certainly. Yes. It was because, both a push and exactly. a pull. Okay, so we're at 1990, 19, in, in, in the early 90s. What's happening there? What happens immediately after you send the page proofs back to the publisher? <laughs> Come on. Well, um, at the very beginning, at the very end of the 1980s, beginning in the 1990s, we start to see the influx of Mexicans from this, uh, especially from this region south of uh, Mexico mm -hmm. City, the Mixteca Alta region of, of Mexico, which uh, uh, Robert C. Smith writes One of my about. colleagues at now, Baruch. Who's been interviewed on his book you know, on this on this okay. very table at this now, very table? Now, what was interesting about the first edition of Latinos in New York was that we uh, learned about Robert C. Smith and and his research 
almost at the end of the process when we were getting ready to submit to the publisher. And so we invited him to contribute, which he did. And his chapter in, in, uh, in the first edition of Latinos in New York is, is really uh, one of the pioneering chapters on, on this subject. And, and it really, and he's continued that work and, and he's exactly. doing it right now, in fact. Yes. It's really yes. a groundbreaking, you know, labor of love for, uh, for Rob. Okay. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, you begin to get um, uh, an increase, rather dramatic, in the number of um, Mexican immigrants coming into the city. Whereas before the Mexican population, or Mexican American population was very small, uh, maybe there were only two or three or four restaurants in the city and they, uh, that specialized in Mexican. Now you're talking uh, my talk, we're talking <laughs> food here. Go ahead. Uh, and, uh, and, some of them, and most of them weren't considered very good. And now uh, that's all changed. Um, so, um, and of course, Robert uh, C. Smith, um, uh, along with uh, two or three others, are the main specialists in, uh, in Mexican immigration to New York, uh, the New York region. Uh, but along with the Mexicans, you also started to get other folks from South America in increasing numbers, uh, especially Colombians and Ecuadorians, but also Peruvians. And sometimes the immigration of um, people from Central America and South America uh, is driven by uh, the politics in their, in their home countries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, during the uh, military dictatorships in Argentina, uh, New York City saw a, uh, a spike in the number of Argentinians coming to New York. Oh, sure. New York. I mean, okay. The same thing happened with uh, Salvador, uh, the overthrow of Salvador Chile, and they, yeah. in Chile after mm -hmm. 1973 during the Pinochet years. Um, more recently, uh, the, uh, the conflicts in Central America, especially El Salvador, mm -hmm. uh, but also Guatemala, and to a lesser degree, uh, Honduras. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been uh, immigration from those countries to New York um, uh, uh, to uh, you know, relatively significant degree. And you get fairly and, and sizable populations of all of these groups in New York City. Exactly. Okay. Now, uh, the ahead. Salvadorans have, uh, have been inclined to settle in the New York suburbs as opposed to the city. So their major impact has been in places like Nassau and Suffolk uh, uh, County out in Long Island. Sarah Mala has a very important book that focuses right. on right. That's probably the most important book published on uh, the Salvadoran experience. Um, but um, um, uh, and in terms of the um, you know, comparing the uh, immigrants from Central Americans and, and South American, South America, uh, I think um, the South Americans, especially the Ecuadorians and the Colombians, have had a, a greater impact uh, relative to the others okay. from those regions. Okay. Uh, the challenge is going is to be trying to capture the whole uh, movement, the whole immigration advocacy movement, and the way that's transformed the politics in New York City. That's going to be really interesting to try to get into that, and also the relationship between the governments, the home countries, and these communities uh -huh. here, that's changed dramatically. In the past, you know, these consulates and all that stuff at the UN were like another planet, they're class-wise. Well, certainly the Mexican now, consulate has been deeply involved with yes, the, the Mexican. The Dominican, yes. yeah. the Venezuelan. They're all. There's also the, the basically dual citizenship, the voting process. Yes. Right. Where you know, people in the Venezuelans, Mexicans can vote here uh, for elections back home. Those transformations, those are fairly recent. And right. those are really interesting. You know, it fits in very much with all that discussion about transnationalism sure. and globalization. Okay, okay, let's let's talk about that. First of all, I mean, there's, there's often talk, and we talked about it last week, about an Hispanic vote. Is there an Hispanic vote that casts ballots as <coughs> a block or nearly an in-block-like monolith? I, I mean, what do we have here politically? I mean, you're talking about all these different groups. Do they differ? Do they conflict with one another? Is there competition? Do Puerto Ricans, you know, run into Dominicans and fight over the same political power, patronage, jobs, etc.? I mean, you, what's the story here? Well, if it's general, uh, if if the issues are generalized, you know, general issues uh, with regard to you know Latinos in general, I, I would say that uh, the different groups, uh, subgroups, come together. 
Uh, and when do it they comes have the lead? I mean, what's the nature of the leadership structure in these communities? Do they have them? Do they talk to one another? How effective? Sometimes I mean, they we, do. We have a three-hour interview here. We only have a half hour, but go yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, sometimes they do. One of the new chapters uh, that's being contributed to the uh, uh, revised edition uh, is by a Colombian journalist by the name of um, uh, Javier Castaño, um, who's working at El Diario at this point? No, no, he has his own paper, uh, uh, Queens Latino. Okay, uh, Queens com. Latino. Yeah, I know he has that. Uh, he's focusing on uh, the Corona section of Queens. Which and was where I had my first job, and, and that, it was 1969. It was yeah. one-third white, yeah. one-third black, yeah. and one-third yeah. Latino, and well, it was yeah. becoming more Latino. For a second, yeah. I thought you were going to say that's where you lost your virginity. But. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice, Angelo. Come on, this is a family show. Give me a break. Go ahead, Gabrielle. Uh, anyway, so um, um, one of his major goals in this chapter was to um, um, discuss the relationships between Colombians, Ecuadorians, Dominicans, um, African Americans who live in different parts of, uh, of Corona. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, form part of the same sort of like uh, political unit, maybe the city council or you know, state mm -hmm. assembly mm -hmm. or something like that. And there is some cooperation. Um, but as a voting bloc, I think what's interesting is uh, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans vote very similarly in terms of the Democratic Party. It's the Democratic uh, Party, really. And, and you have a difference in Queens of degree. You know, you still have majorities of uh, Latinos in Queens, the South Central Americans that vote Democratic, but at a lesser degree. And that's going to be the interesting thing in seeing whether the, the consequences of those, those differences and whether in the future, you know, you may see some divisions and some diversification politically. But right now, it's pretty much, uh, uh, I wrote a chapter for this other book on uh, the 2008 election in New York. And one of the, the name of it is The Cost of Loyalty, uh, which uh, raised the issue of uh, the, with the loyalty, the strong loyalty that Latinos in New York City have to the Democratic Party. What is the cost of that in terms of their... Okay, they're power? giving me the goodbye sign. Uh, 2013, there's elections, no Latino citywide candidate. What's the story with Latinos in politics in New York City? Give yeah. it to me in 30 seconds. Well, I, uh, well, I mean, I, to, you know, to me, that, that's what, as I said, the cost of that loyalty to the yeah. Democratic Party has been interesting, that, that being part of the, and being so loyal to the party has, has its costs, and part of it is that the party has not been responsive to this community. It takes that vote for granted. One of the consequences is you don't have the party nurturing a Puerto Rican leadership or a Latino leadership uh, in terms of citywide offices, statewide offices. Uh, that's a dilemma we face uh, in the community, and we're trying to figure out what to, how to handle that, and that's the issue where we're at now, where the community, a lot of the leadership is very fragmented, you have the, the, Im the dominant images are of Latino elected officials going to try on trial, handcuffed. going to handcuff, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, that's a real dilemma. So that, I think the book is going to try to address that and, and talk about where we're going. I have the final chapter, uh, which is uh, uh, writing about the future of the community. So uh, these are the kinds of issues we'll, we'll try to you know, grapple with in, in this book. Okay, when does the book come out? When, are you gonna, when is it going to get published? Hopefully next year. You coming back? I mean, you guys have to come back. We have to talk about this book. It's fine and dandy. Good. My <laughs> thanks to both of you. My thanks to Angelo Falcone and Gabrielle Haslip Vieira for being on the show. See you next week here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>